Second Corinthians chapter 11, I'm just down a verse. Verse 5. For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles. Look at verse 6. But though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge. Many of you might probably think that of you are very rude in speech. Uh, you do not stand your aces. Uh, your oracy still is wanting. And uh, you can be termed rude in speech. Well, that rude, by the way, actually is the Greek word idiotic. Where we get the word ignoramus from and where we get the word idiot from. Paul is actually saying, for although I be an idiot in speech, yet not in knowledge. My friend, I may be an idiot in speech, but not in knowledge. For so indeed I have received many revelations of the Lord, and I do not fall behind those that are above me in knowing who the God is in my service. And those revelations are not for my own personal edification, but to be passed on to the body of Christ so that they can be blessed with them. And they're going to be blessed with them tonight. Hallelujah. The controversy today is this. Healing. Is it God's will for all? Because in this audience right now, there are some people who are sick and have a need of healing. And you can't receive healing until you have come to a place and established within yourself whether it is not the will of God for your life. If it is not the will of God, then it is in sovereignty. You will always be continually in hope. Like the lady that come up and I said, what do you want, love? Well, I'm hoping God will heal me. I say, well, you go back to your seat because he won't. <laughs> hope is future. But the next one came up and I said, what do you want, love? I says, I've got faith to believe God will hear me tonight. I said, he will. See, there's a great deal of difference between hope and there's a great deal of difference between faith. And most people are open. So you can hope you're blue in the face, but it won't get you anything. It's when that hope turns into faith. And the controversy is this. Does God forgive us not only our sins, but do you also heal our sicknesses? Can it be found in the atonement? The atonement is when Jesus Christ was put on Golgotha's hill, when nails were driven in him, he suffered for all mankind. Was it only spiritual or was it also physical? But I believe that the will of the Lord can be seen through the person of Jesus Christ, God walking this earth. And here is an instance where Jesus is in an house and these people let a man down through the roof they wanted to get to him and they lowered him through the roof and he was in need of healing because he had the palsy and Jesus looked at him and he said son thy sins be forgiven thee and those religious turkeys with all of their garments on they looked and they muttered to each other and they said inwardly and they said who can forgive sins but God alone and Jesus not only reading minds but hearts turned round to them he said what is easier to say thy sins be forgiven thee or take up thy bed and walk and to prove that the son of man hath power on earth take up thy bed and walk he collected his bed and walked folks for years the church has been able to say one thing son, daughter, child thy sins are forgiven thee why have they been able to say that with confidence? because it demands no outward sign or manifestation but for me then to say thy sickness pick up thy bed and walk demands that I have enough faith in the living God to believe that that man will act and receive his healing and take up his bed and walk and people will be astonished. All that healing is ever used for, my friend, is to get people's attention. Just remember, there are two confessions. In the Word of God in Romans chapter 10, 
It says that if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. How then does salvation come? By saying something with the mouth and believing something with the heart. My friend, I'm going to make a statement tonight that the same way that salvation comes is the same way that healing comes. There are two confessions found in the Word of God. In Romans chapter 10, he tells us that faith cometh by hearing. That is a confession unto faith. Faith comes by hearing. You will walk out of this door tonight with more faith than when you came in. Why? You are hearing the Word of God. You are seeing the Word of God. Your spirit man is being built up. And at the end of it, some of you are going to receive beautiful things from God. Let me say this. There's two confessions. There's a confession unto faith and there's a confession of faith. You say, what's the difference? Well, Mark 11, 23, 24 is a confession of faith. If you will say unto this mountain, what do you say it with? Your mouth and believe in your heart and shall not doubt whoever shall say it. Notice he word, uses the word say three times. You have to open your mouth three times and once you believe in the heart, that is a confession of faith. Romans 10 Faith cometh by hearing is a confession unto faith. Confession will produce a faith. Confession will produce faith. And guess what faith will produce? A confession. But there are some people who are going around on the confession unto faith. By his stripes I am healed. By his stripes I am healed in the name of Jesus. Isaiah 53 says that he took my pains, bore my sickness, and they're going around and they are saying it, but it's a confession unto faith. It is not a confession of faith. And a confession unto faith won't get you healed, won't get your finances, won't get you out of trouble. It is the confession of faith when you've said that in your mouth, or you've said it with your mouth, and you're not only believing with your mouth, in the name of Jesus, you have said that I am the prosperous one. You said that the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. And you start saying it, but you're not only saying it, your eyes are fixed firmly on the word of God. And all of a sudden, something kicks from your stomach, comes out of you, and you say, in the name of Jesus, that mountain, be there removed. And then all of a sudden, the confession of faith is operative, and you receive your manifestation. Alan keeps saying it's right. Just because he says it's right does not mean it's right. But it is right. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. You always have a good time, eh, Alice? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, some woman, I tell you. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Question. Does God use sickness to chastise people? Maybe. Well, brother, I've had this sickness, and in this sickness I have been in hospital beds, and I've been, and I've been able to minister to the nurses, I've been able to minister to the doctors, I've been able to minister to everyone that I have come across having this illness. And you can't tell me that God has not used that illness. I cannot tell her that God has used that illness, but I can tell her that God did not give her that illness. There is a great deal of difference. And if we are not too sure in our mind whether it is that God would give us the sickness and allow that sickness to remain on there so that then if we work out purposes of God, then we're in an area and it's called a grey area. We're not too sure. See, some people say all things work together to good to those who love God and are called according to his purposes. Now, every one of you is called. Every one of you is called. All things work together to good to those who love God. Now, the word, the emphasis is on the word love. My friends, I am not being rude, but in this context, that means that love there is the closest association a man can possibly get with a woman as close as they possibly can, that actually in context is how the word love is used. In other words, when I am with my wife, 
and I am joined that pleasure of sexual intercourse which God gave us. The same thing is that when all things work together to good is when I am in intercourse with God, communication, that we are joined together in one. I am hearing the voice of God. I'm walking in the light and the, and the light just opened to me. Then all things work together for good for me because I love God and I'm close to him. I'm in communion with him. I'm intimate with him. Don't use that verse if you're not intimate with God. Don't use that verse if you don't have a quiet time. Don't use that verse if your car breaks down. All things work together for good because your car will be standing there till the year 999. Oh, no, 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 no. It's right, folks. I used to use that. Oh, all things work together for good. Sprain my ankle. All things did not work together for good. It's for when you love God. And the love is emphasized is agape, and that agape is a closeness where you and God are just walking in one. Why so many Christians stumble around and they say, I don't know what the will of God is above. I'm in the dark, I just don't know what he wants me to do. Is because they're out of the light. God is light and in there is no darkness. And if we say that we're in the light and have fellowship with him, then we, we walk in the light as he walks in the light. But if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and we're not in the light. It is possible to be a Christian thinking that you are walking with God and actually be in the darkness. There's no sincerity, there's no option on sincerity, my friend. A blind man will lead another blind man into an hour. You don't need anybody to counsel you unless you know that they are walking with the Lord. I don't get any turkey to come up to me and start giving me advice. I say, hey man, where are you with the Lord? I want to know. And before I would even approach or get on the phone and ring anybody up, I would make sure of their walk before the Lord. If I couldn't get in touch with Mr. Pedley, I would ring, you know, the next place I'd ring, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and ring up Bob Yandra. I'd say, hey, Bob, I'm having a problem. I need your prayer. I could confide that with him because I know where he is with the Lord. He'd say, well, he's 6,000 miles away. No, he's not. I know where he is in my spirit. He's with the Lord. Hallelujah. Does God use sickness? If God uses sickness on people, well, let me ask you this question. If your child tonight was a disobedient, uh, young earlier, uh, would you then chastise him by saying, here, have a flu? That'll keep him under. That'll stop him running around the place. And if your little daughter, you know, starts to get a bit off the here, have a cancer. That'll keep him quiet. My friend, if you were known to do that, if it was possible, and the authorities got to know about it, do you know that you could be able to add up the child abuse? Do you know that you could be add up the child abuse? And yet people have been telling us for years in the body of Christ that God is putting sickness on us to keep us humble and he's teaching us in his sickness. For oh God is my father, I am his son, he is abusing me, he's putting sickness on me. And he should be locked up. God is not weird. He is not flaky, my friend. If God doesn't use sin, sickness to chastise us, does he use sin to chastise us? Oh, he made me feel that because he wants me humble. Oh, dear Lord. Oh, I just took it. God wants me to be humble. That's sin. Did he put that on us? No. And for many times, so many of us have fell into the trap that when a manifestation is upon us, a bodily illness, that we have in some way accepted it and just gone along with it willy-nilly. Oh, thank you, Lord, you're the healer, but really, we couldn't even convince ourselves, never mind God. We couldn't convince ourselves. Another question. Why would God use something to chastise us with sickness that he went to the cross to destroy. Don't make sense. Don't make sense at all. I want to tell you how God chastises you. He says in 1st, 2nd Timothy 3.16 that all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction. Do you get that? For correction, for your kids, for yourself reproof, 
for correction, for training in righteousness. How does God chastise us? He chastises us by his word. If God wants to deal with you, my friend, if you're backsliding, if you're out of the light, if you're sliding so far into sin, don't think that God somewhere along the line is going to jump, jump rheumatoid arthritis on you and say, well, that will get him back to me. And that's what a lot of people have been saying. See, my friend, the Bible says that the gifts of God are without, and callings are without repentance. And I know a guy in Wellington that went blind. He was a preacher on the street for years who actually slid away from the Lord and he, be, he became blind. And the thing that went all around New Zealand was that it was the, Lord, the chastisement of the Lord upon that man. He could even come to an open air and stand by him and you'd hear him there still speaking in tongues. See, God had given him a gift of the Holy Ghost and he says that the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. If he's given you something, folks, he ain't going to take it back no time. So if you've received the Holy Ghost and you start speaking in tongues, it's like, oh, I've got to keep that. It's okay, you've got it for good. God will never withdraw it from you. The only way that you leave it will ever be withdrawn is if you stop using it. And a lot of people do. What's this tongue for? And they just hold up and then they just lose it. But God never takes it away from them. It's like a, an arm that is strapped up with a bandage. Left there for 12 months, it loses all of its use and it hangs there and it's gone. It's the same with tongues. Turn to 1 Peter 5.5. 5. Sickness keeps us humble. That is the statement that has been made. Verse 5 of 1 Peter chapter 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the older. Yea, all of you be subject one to another. Be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. He gives grace to the humble. Say after me, He gives grace to the humble. Is sickness grace? No, my friend, at the cross he offered healing as grace. It's just to think that God would cause us to steal or to be sick to keep us humble. If he wants to get you humble, you are going to get a revelation tonight of what true humility is. A little revelation for you tonight, friends. And it's going to be what is true humility. He got the great one. But all, some of us have thought that humility is acting in a way that is befitting some kind of trance that is down and out. Oh no, that's not good enough for me. Two jackets. You got 60 pounds? I better take the 45 when I don't want to look too flash. Hallelujah. Don't look at me in that tone of voice, Phil. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 5. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. My favourite tune. My favourite story about John Newton working on the pumps there on a ship. He himself was a slave trader in Africa. His father was a minister, but he'd gone away from the Lord. And this time he's coming back to England and he's on that ship and they are caught in a gale. The wind's blowing and all of the sails are falling down. The water's coming over and the captain says to him, Newton, get to the pump. And he's pumping away and he's thinking, Skipper, are we going to get out of there? He says, if God gives us grace and he's pumping away, it's coming to him. Grace, if only God will give us grace. If God, you will give me grace to get me out of this position out of this storm I'll turn my heart to you and all of a sudden the wind died down and those calm blue seas and he sailed John Newton wrote that song Amazing Grace as sweet the sound that say the rest like me what is grace? he go to somebody's house would somebody like to say grace for what we are about to see may the Lord make you thankful Amen 
Everybody talks to him like a load of pigs. What is grace? It is not sufficient for me to know that grace is something. I said to my mates in Wellington, because I heard Judy Collins, and I heard Glenn Campbell, and I heard the Scott Dragoon Guards, and they all played Amazing Grace, and he was just full of in me. And I said, well, what's grace, brother? What is it? He says, well, it is, the definition in really, Bob, is unmerited favour. That has satisfied me for four years. But it came to the time when it satisfied me no longer. Because I got certain verses and I couldn't put that there and make sense. Paul thorn in the flesh, for example. And I besought the Lord three times that he take his thorn out of my flesh. And I beseeched him three times. And he says, Paul, my unmerited favour is sufficient for thee. Where did that leave me? Back at square one. Tonight, folks, you're going to get to know what grace is. Hallelujah. Grace is God reaching out to you. Faith is you reaching out to God. Faith receives what God has already given in grace. He initiated his folks. He has done it all. And there ain't nothing that you can do to help him. It was done 2,000 years ago. Your salvation was purchased. Your healing was purchased. Your prosperity was purchased. Your heavenly visitation. Everything pertaining to godliness and truth that can benefit you has already been paid for, signed, sealed and delivered. And you can't do anything to warrant or deserve it. So you might as well stop straining at the bit now and stop and say, if that's a fact, I don't even have to go to church. Well, in a way, that's true. If you're coming to church because you're an under an, 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 an potion because everybody goes to church and it's a thing we must do on a Sunday, then my friend, you don't understand grace. If you're going to do an open air on Saturday with me and you're coming because, well, it could please the Lord to me to be out there and he's to learn me brownie points with God, you don't understand grace. That don't that doesn't please in one little bit. If you think tonight I'll stay up two hours praying and I'll read my Bible for an hour, even though I am tired and I don't understand it, that'll please God, then you have missed it because you don't understand grace. Grace has done everything for you. How sweet the sound is free. He's given it to you and there ain't one little thing that you can do to warrant or deserve it and say, God, here's ten bomb. Will that help you? How do you say, keep your ten bomb. For by grace are you saved. That's true faith. Not of yourself. It is a gift of God. What do you do with a gift? Do you have to pay for it? You receive it free. And my friend, this is my definition of God's grace. Grace is God's willingness to use His power and His ability on my behalf, even though I don't warrant or deserve it. Can you see the definitions of grace now? Yeah. We're going to be turning right away to Paul's thorn in the flesh. For years this has had me stuck because for years I was under that bondage to do things by rote. Church on a Sunday, open air at three o'clock, prison, so on. And if I missed one of them, I got under condemnation. Would it surprise you to even tell you that today I haven't even read any of my Bible? Dear Lord, if I'd have said that in the Brethren Church in New Zealand, they would have burned me as an heretic. But they would probably have burned me in effigy or something. You haven't read your Bible. And you're going out to preach the gospel. Look, friends, I am so full of the Word of God, I don't think I have to read it now. I am so full of the Word of God that it just comes out of me anyway. And why I got the Word of God in me was not through the sense of duty 
Oh, that I'd better read my Bible. It was because all of a sudden I fell in love with my Papa Daddy. I am intimate with him continually all the way through the day. Me and him, me and him are always having intercourse and when you have intercourse, you're likely to get pregnant and when you're pregnant, you'll conceive. And what's conceived in my life is the power and the ability that God gives me because I know my weakness. With my weakness, I can't do anything but through Jesus Christ, I can do all things. You are looking at a weak person. You are looking at an insufficient person. You're looking at a person that nine years ago used to stutter and wouldn't even speak to a woman in a pub unless he'd had ten pints of bitter under his belt. You say, dear God, you've changed. I tell you what's changed me is grace. Lord, I can't get up there. Let me give you a testimony. When I came here this morning, I came with an insufficiency in me and I've only ever felt it once before of such magnitude and that was the day of the convention. And at the day of the convention, I said to Chris, I said, look, man, be ready to catch me. He said, uh, what do you mean? I said, look, uh, you know, I was there trying to make an excuse. I I'm an evangelist. I can't teach. You're giving me two hours. What in the world am I going to say in two hours? Okay, uh, I've got things to tell them. I felt so insufficient that I, honest, I just, I nearly asked him to take over my spot. I got up there, and I don't know if anybody's ever listened to the tape, it's called Effective Evangelism, but within two minutes, all of a sudden, there was a blind guy who I gave a prophecy, and that the Spirit of God just come on me so much that Pedley and all of you lot like, couldn't have dragged me up there. Two hours was not enough! Two hours was not enough! Once again, I had that wonderful knowledge of knowing that God's grace, His power, His ability was waiting for me. But Bob, you have got to stand by faith, get on the stage first, even though you're trembling, you don't know what to say. But when you're on there, son, I'll eat you in your power, and if you need to hold you, hold you. That's right. You are not weak, son. You are not weak in Christ. Okay. It is by faith that it might be of grace. What are you laughing at? To the end the promise might be sure to all the seed. No wonder anybody buys my faith. <laughs> <laughs> when God reaches out in grace, he's got something in his hand to give you. And he's got something in his hand to give certain people tonight. But the way that you receive that gift is by faith you reaching up. There's got to be no doubt whatsoever in your heart that, oh, will he take it back? Will he withdraw it if I reach up? Did he really want me to have it? You've got to have a positive thought in your heart that God wants to give it. And then by faith you reach up and take it. It's all right, all right. It's all right. All right. <laughs> You've got to understand grace always comes first. Otherwise, faith would have nothing to base its claims upon. Can you see that? That's why you've got to know what grace is. God's willingness to give you something. God's willingness to show his power and his ability in your life. God's willingness. And you by faith say, okay, Father, I want it. Some of you are wondering, why is it that you can go home and preach? Boy, I got in the car coming back from Cheltenham the other week. Did I get a mega bashing? He was there, yakety yak, revelation, revelation. And I thought, dear God, I better give him one of the, my uh, meetings next Sunday. But this man, I have never heard anybody like him. He went for the doctor. I couldn't get a word in edgeways, and I thought, oh, dear Lord. And I, he is a preacher. But at the moment, he has preached in his room. He has preached to me in the car, but the time is coming when he is going to be standing up here preaching before you. But the proviso is this, son, that how you feel in your room when you're preaching and how you feel in the car when you're in private preaching is going to be far removed from the time when you stand up here and the devil says, you can't do it. And all of a sudden, 
the self-confidence that you had as preaching in your room to yourself and the self-confidence and the anointing that was coming out when you're preaching to me when you get up here or just before you'll have that come upon you saying you can't do it praise God when that comes because then you'll be able to say that's right I can't but my sufficiency is not in myself it's of God his grace is sufficient for me his grace to show his power and his ability through me he's willing to do it let's go God let's go and you'll get it sir. hallelujah please receive these I don't know where they're coming from please receive these we seem to think that at the end we've got our prophecies and words that are coming out right now you should take that you should either take if you don't know it write it down meditate on it you too they won't all be just like call out Julian when the word comes you want to receive it hallelujah so God we find out to the humble person he gives what and what does he give to the proud person we're going to find out let's turn to 1 Peter 5 6 I exalt thee I exalt thee. Yes, I messaged the singing in Bob. Just get on the preaching. That, that's what they nearly said to me last week at Cheltenham when I'm in the praise and worship. Thank you. Uh, that, uh, uh, my brother, Ethan Verse 5, 1 Peter chapter 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of ye be subject one to another. Be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud... Who does God resist? The proud and giveth grace to the humble. Verse 6. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you. Say it after me. Exalt me. Exalt me. God resisteth the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you. How far can you go in your being exalted of God? What is the measure? There's no, that's right, there's no measure at all. Kenneth Hagin is at top of the pillar, as we would say yet, but Kenneth Hagin can go even farther. Kenneth Copeland does not reach the ice. There is none measurable to where a person can go whom God says, humble yourself under my mighty hand and I will lift you up. There's no place that he will stop in exalting you. You, you, you. There's so often, oh, I'm getting a bit too big in this ministry now. I've got tapes out and I'm, I'm selling books and people are offering to have me and speak and all that. I'd better start to be, you know, watch myself, my friend. You just need to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And once you do, he'll lift you up. We're going to find out what the revelation of humility is. How do we humble ourselves? How do we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God? Is it to get uh, some sackcloth and ashes and throw it on and, and tear and, and moan and cry and go without food for days? That has been the definition of humility. Oh, I've had nothing to eat today, brother duty for the kingdom of God well if that's your attitude it ain't finding any fun with God at all and all I can say is you're missing out and food and you shouldn't be <laughs> oh dear if ever there was a man that had a long face like a Pharisee when he was fasting it was me everybody for miles around knew I, I was not eating Bob spiritual is not eating dear God <laughs> what keeps I want you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 1 hallelujah chapter 28 of Deuteronomy now it shall come and it shall be if you will diligently obey the Lord your God being careful to do all his commandments which I command you today the Lord your God will what? set you on I above all the nations of the earth how does God exalt a person? 
from here to there by their being diligent to do and obey the word of God. The word of God that in turn will humble you. It is the word of God that humbles us. It is not sickness that humbles us. It is not sin that humbles us. It is the word of God if you diligently hearken to and obey the Lord thy God or do we diligently and hearken to him the more that you get of the word the more that you will be exalted. My friends, you want exaltation then exalt the word. Keep up the word out and the word will produce and people will want to come along and say what's going on here? What's happening? The word, the word, the word will keep you humble and God says I will set you above all the nations of the earth. There is no place where God will stop and you exalting you if you will first exalt the word of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's the word that keeps you humble. It will keep you on track with God. Every time you open it, when you're feeling a bit prideful or whatever, just read the Word of God and I tell you, it brings a soberness on one soul, doesn't it? As soon as you open it, you can be laughing at Tom and Jerry or Morecambe and Wise and just go into your bedroom and open the Bible then all of a sudden all of that worldly stuff, all of that funny stuff has to stop because you're in the presence of Almighty God and His Word and it brings us a soberness of heart and all of a sudden you're there, you're starting to humble yourself under the mighty under God. It is the Word of God that causes you to be humble. And he says, if you will hearken and my word, be humble under my word, allow it to speak to you. Allow it to not only speak to you, but to do it as it's spoken. He says, after you've humbled yourself, I will exalt you. God exalt you. Turn to 2 Corinthians 12, 7. They have told me for many times, people have said, that, well, brother, there is a scripture that tells us quite positively that God does use sickness to keep people who are prideful down. And they will refer you to Second Corinthians. They will refer you to Paul's thorn in the flesh. And my friend, I had it in my early days in my church in New Zealand. I've already preached in America. I've heard it in every country I've been to. And I have never yet found anybody who could argue against it because it seemed so conclusive. The thing is that people would say that Paul had an eye disease. Even Weiss, who I study a great deal of as a Greek, he will even tell you that he had a disease called opathelioma or something like that, a disease of the eye which is common in them days where pus would actually run from the person's eye down their face continually streaming and to look upon them was really a bad sight. It is a known medical disease. It has been accounted for. They said Paul had this. Well, how do we know he had that? Well, it says in the Bible, don't you see how large letters I write on my letter? They say, there you are. Paul had that eye. That's why he wrote long and big letters. Then at another time it says, an eye Theophilus say unto you and I depart who am writing this letter. Paul was not writing the letter. He had somebody else say, yeah, oh, brother, Paul couldn't see with his, all his pus running down his eyes with his disease and because of that he had somebody else to take the letter. Now look, some of you have probably heard of a Bible called Date Bible. Very expensive, whatever it was. 55 pounds, they are great. And Date Bible of comments along there. I can't have one because the print is so small it's sending me back and trying to read it. But they have been a source of information to most preachers and teachers and I would recommend that they would be in your library. But we're going to find out what Mr. Date says as regards this scripture, his comments. Okay? I'm going to start first and read it. In Second Corinthians chapter 12, Verse 6, For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me, or be as he heareth of me. Verse 7, Unless 
I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation that was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord Christ, that it might be far from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly will I therefore will I glory in my infirmities, that the power of God of Christ may rest upon me. People say, there you are. He says that Paul, he did say that he did not, not know whether he was in the body or out of the body, but he was caught up into the third heaven. There's revelation knowledge for you, revealing that there's more than one heaven. He said he was caught up to the third. There must be another two, one two. But he says that while he was there, things were revealed to him. And while he was there, things of which he could not speak were revealed to him. And they will say he had so many revelations given to him that time when he was in heaven with Christ, receiving all the mysteries that he was about to reveal, just so that he would not get puffed up and so dogmatic about these things and thinking that he was above the apostles, they were giving him a form, a physical ailment that would keep him humble and he'd always have to look to God to be his strength and sufficiency. Well, my friend, we're going to find out that is a load of rubbish. What did Dave say? If God's got an objective, some people say, and a lot in this room believe it, that God's got an objective and he doesn't care whether he'll use Satan to get that objective done. Some believe that. That God will actually use and to treat the services of Satan to bring about his purposes. Let me tell you, friend, God is big enough to bring about his purposes without the way you should soon face. That's right. And it's about time we understood that. What they say, God did not want Paul, now this is a Greek scholar, God did not want Paul to exalt himself through the abundance of revelation given to him so that he permitted him to have a thorn in the flesh to keep him humble. Think about it, folks. Think about it. God brought a thorn in his flesh to keep him humble. Thorns in the flesh don't keep you humble. We have just read from Deuteronomy chapter 28 that if we do diligently and hearken unto the commands of the Lord, he will set us above on high and above every nation. We just found out that it is the word of God that brings us uh, to that place of humility. It is the word of God that keeps us humble, so thorns in the flesh don't keep us humble. What is it that keeps you humble? The word of God. Jake goes on to say this, an angel of Satan, one of the spirit beings which fell with him, followed Paul around and buffeted him when he was tempted to become exalted. Every time Paul got past up in pride, the devil went around and got him. He didn't puffed up in pride. Got him. Too funny. My friend, can you see the nonsensical argument in that? That one of the things that Satan would like us to be this day is proudful. And can you imagine that, oh, Bob's getting a bit proudful. <coughs> Make him humble. This is the pride comes before the fall. Satan ain't going to jump on you when you're getting prideful, my friend. He can allow it to happen because you know the pride will bring about the fall. So how in the world is this demon going around saying, oh, he's getting prideful again. Poof, let's get him. That, this is easy. That, just like that. Shows it with a, a load of rubbish. My friends, the way that we are humble, once again I will say it, is through the word of God. Because if Satan's going around and he sees me getting prideful, and does Satan want me prideful? Then he must be work, working against himself if he gives a demon to jump on me to stop me being prideful. And it says in an house that he's divided amongst himself. Four can't stand. So he's defeating himself. Makes no sense whatsoever. So we need to find out that what Paul's thorn in the flesh is. What does God do? For the humble. He what? 
verse 7, lest I should be exalted above measure. What measure? Who is giving the measure? What measure? What measure? Is there any measure that I can go in the service of God as to my being exalted if I keep close and humble before him? There's no measure, is there? No measure. And he says here, lest I should be exalted above measure. God has got no measure, friends. He wants to see you at the top of the pile and if you want to go to the top of the pile, he'll let you go to the top of the pile as long as you humble yourself underneath him. How do I humble myself, Bob? By keeping in the word of God, exalt the word of God, and then God says, I will exalt you. And he says, no measure on the exaltation to where he will take you. But he says here, lest I should be exalted above measure. Whose measure is this that he might be exalted above? Whose measure is it? I hear Satan's and his own. It's Satan's, my friends. It's Satan's measure. Unless I should be exalted above measure. Let me ask you a question. Is the word I should be, lest I should be, is that past, present or future? Well, do you spank your kid for something that he has not done? Hey, hey, come here, Earl. What? What's that for? Just in case you do. <laughs> and he's saying here, unless I should be, he's not yet, lest I should be, future, exalted above measure, a messenger of Satan was given unto me. Why would God discipline him for something that he hadn't done? That makes God unfair. Can you see, my friend, now? how all of this just drops to pieces under the observation and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit revealing it to you. And what this is doing tonight is just kicking away those doubts why you're healing us in come. Is it really the will of God? Why am I always being having this sickness? Why is it, is it really that God would have me to have this sickness so I could keep humble? My friend, the answer is no. No. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 7, Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of what? Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance revelations don't make you exalted. Abundance of revelations are designed to keep you humble. The more I know about the Word of God and the more that is revealed to me from the Word of God, whether it's through teachers, whether it's in my own quiet time, the more I get to know, the more humble I become because I realize that I ain't got nowhere yet. I know nothing and I have a need of God continually, 24 hours a day, every minute of the hour, every second of the minute. I am not sufficient in myself. The abundance of revelations that I have received, my friend, does not puff me up. It has kept me humble. Hallelujah. I want to say this. That if Satan came in to stop Paul's ministry being exalted, he'd done it because he wanted that ministry to not be exalted above any other ministry that is in the territory. And my friends, you can get a thorn in the flesh. It's like this. He can see in you a potential, son. I'm talking about Satan now. He can see in you the potential to become greater than Kenneth Copeland. He can see the potential within you, and so he's going to try to hold that potential back. And there will be thorns given to you in your flesh. But once you have come to know what the thorn in the flesh is, and as you have received the revelation of grace, you have also received this night the revelation of humility and that, uh, that thorn in the flesh will never be able and God will exalt you. But you are going to have thorns in the flesh. And the thorn in the flesh, to many of you, is not your wife. It is not. Not your husband. It is not. It is not your mother in law and in God. A thorn in the flesh, my friend, you're all going to experience it 
every one of us who has purpose in his heart to go on with God. I want us to know we find it only once in the New Testament. We only find that account of a thorn in the flesh. We want to know where it is and what does it mean. Let's turn to the Old Testament. Numbers 33, verse 55. Numbers 33, 55. But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come about that those whom you let remain of them will become as pricks in your eyes and as thorns in your sides, and they shall trouble you in the land which you live. Moses is saying this, if you don't take command of what God told you, to get away with the parasites, the Amalek, the Iroquois, the termites. If you don't continue to keep them people out from among you, they will constantly be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your eyes. Now, my friends, is that talking about a literal thorn in your uh, side? Is that talking about a literal prick in your eye? No. It's descriptive of somebody, your enemy, today is the same one that will bring freaks in your side. Thorns in your side, continually, you'll experience what Paul experiences as you go on with God. So we're going to see how we can deal with it. Joshua 23, 13. Hallelujah. Joshua 23, 13. Know with certainty that the Lord your God will not continue to drive these nations out from before you, but they shall be a snare and a trap to you and a whip on your side and thorns in your eyes until you perish of this good land which the Lord your God has given you. My friend, in both instances, and there's another instance that's found in Second Samuel 23, 6, it is mentioned thorn in the side, pricked in the eyes. In each case, it is talking about a personality. You say, what about people? Why is it that the people who would say there was a messenger sent from Satan, notice who it was sent from, not God. There was a messenger given to me from Satan. The word messenger is the word angela, where we get the word angel. There was an angel sent from Satan to buffet me. God didn't send it. And my friend, the word buffet is used three or four times in the Bible. And it tells us that in the one instance when Jesus was before his captives, when he was in the praetorium, when they put a sack over his head, that he was struck and he was struck and he was struck and he was struck until he was buffeted and buffeted. That's the same word. He was buffeted this way, buffeted that way. Prophesy, O Son of God, who is it that eats you? And Jesus, the Bible says, was more marred than any other man. Even his own mother couldn't recognize him. That same word is used here. There was given an angel from Satan to buffet me. Well, we're going to find out what the buffet is. Let's carry on. Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord three times, that it wrong, that is. It's a personality, not a it. It is not a disease, then it would be a it. It is not an eye disease, then it would be a it. In the Greek, it is a E was given to me. What does an E indicate? That he is a personality. He is somebody that is following behind Paul. And every time Paul goes one way, he's with him. And he's just buffeting him this way, that way, that way. That's what it is. It is not no sickness. It is not no eye disease. And he said unto me, and I, for this I besought the Lord Christ, that he might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Okay. We need to know, just before I finish, what Paul's infirmities are. Turn back to chapter. Chapter 11. 
starting in verse 23, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, in labours more abundantly, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times I received, forty stripes saved one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Three times I suffered shipwreck. A night and day I have been in the deep, in journey and tossing, in peril of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils amongst false brethren, in weariness, painfulness, watching often, hunger, prayer, fasting, often, in cold nakedness, beside these things that we shall without, there cometh upon me daily the care of all the churches. Who is weak? And am I not weak? Who is offended? And I burn not? If I must need glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. My friend, the Bible which we read was written in 1611. We must understand that there has been some translation changes taken place from 1611 to the present day. For example, the word love in the King James is used the word charity. We never use charity today. Oh, Nicola, I charity to you. We don't say that, we do. How do we associate with charity? some faith when you're selling your old socks which you can't do with any longer and your old hats which you've thrown out there's a charity speech on so we know that that word has gone out of existence to what it meant firstly in the King James and another word that's gone out of existence in the King James is the word infirmities we go to the eye infirmary we go to the infirmary well they are Bob sicknesses my friend it means in the Greek and it means in the 1611 edition of the Bible it means weaknesses you go down there to all of Paul's infirmity and missing by its absence sticks out a mile is sickness can you find it me one can you find it me one what Paul is saying is this there was a messenger given me I was getting to be above in my ministry, above Kevin, uh, Kenneth Copeland. Oh, Bob's getting above Kenneth Hagen. He's going for broke. Even so there was a messenger given unto Bob. And as Bob left Chesley Nye and he caught the train to Liverpool, he went off the track, but he was miraculously saved. He got to Liverpool and he booked on the boat from Liverpool to Dublin. Right on the way to Dublin, there was a tempest suddenly come up. All of a sudden the boat sank, but Bob was miraculously escaped. He spent three days in the Irish Sea. He was dragged out of there. He was cold, but he was well. He gets to Dublin. When he gets to Dublin, he's only got his trousers on, and three, I three Irishmen jump out, and they mug him, and they take all his money in his trousers. Bob then makes his way down to County Cork, and when he gets down to County Cork, there's somebody then jumps out from behind the edge and takes even that what he's got on his underpants. He's left naked. He can't get anywhere to sleep because nobody will put him up. He comes back. He gets the boat from Dublin. Blow me down if this one doesn't sink too. He's there in the water. He's cold. But they fish him out over in Hollyhead. When he gets to Hollyhead, and Bob is right, he's time sick of all of this. He's saying, Lord, Lord, when's that turkey going to stop this? Lord, will you be seat safe to knock it up? I've had enough Paul. My ability, my willingness to use my power is yours. Use it, Paul. My grace is sufficient for you. Glory! 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 Oh, dear Lord. I have infirmities every day. The turkey has a go at my car, the battery start motor. Oh dear Lord. And I keep saying, Lord, what is happening? And he's just whispering over my shoulder, My grace is sufficient for thee. I now know I don't have to wonder on merit and favour. Even on merit and favour is sufficient for me. I know what his grace is. His willingness to use his power. Can you think of that? Use his power 
on my behalf, even though I don't want or deserve it. Ain't God good? Ain't God good? And Paul goes on to say there in Second Corinthians 12, verse 9, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness, most gladly, therefore will I rather glory in my gift, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I'm what day? I'm what day? Because he did to be anointed. He did to be anointed for a period. I feel like I'm anointed. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord humbled me. <laughs> uh, that's why sometimes after I've ministered, I just want to, I've got no spirituality left in me. I can't even counsel a person because he has given me for the time limit that I have been here his sufficiency. But if I had that sufficiency all the time, Boy, wouldn't I do the top 50? And how many times is it that we say, Lord, I'll go out in the open air if you'll just give me a power first? He never will. He'll always wait for you to go in out in your weakness. Paul, would you like to stand up and give your testimony in the building? Well, yeah. And then all of a sudden, the power of God works for us. He's got to be weak before he can become strong. It's a paradox, my friend. But if you're feeling mighty good and strong,